Thank you. You may be seated. And you know it's one of my favorite habits to point out that you have just sung a promise to God. That's a hymn of commitment. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what that little phrase is dealing with there. For thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me, I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne. Making Jesus the Lord of your life, not merely your Savior. My life I give, henceforth to live, from this moment on. Each verse that you sang that, you sang it four times. Do you really mean it? My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Be sure you mean what you sing, otherwise don't sing it. All right, let's take our Bibles. <laughs> and I suppose next week now nobody will sing, but let's, let's hope that's not the case. Okay. <laughs> We're turning over to Acts chapter 9. Tonight we'll be looking at verses 9 and 10. It's the second half of our series on divine direction last week was Do Not Enter, Divine Direction Part 1, where we see that the Holy Spirit prevented Paul from going a certain direction on his missionary journey. Tonight we see Gospel Green Light, Divine Direction Part Number 2. I'll start reading at verse 6 and I'll read through verse 9. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not, and they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia! and help us and after he had seen the vision immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them let's pray our gracious Heavenly Father how we praise you and thank you that you do give clear direction that you cause events and circumstances of life to correspond with the commands and the prohibitions of Scripture you give to us understanding and insight and motivation to serve in certain locations and with certain people you give us opportunities and father many times we unfortunately turn those opportunities down though you have made the door open you have made the green light clear you have caused us to understand that where we are we are to be witnesses whether we're in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria or the uttermost parts of the earth we are your witnesses you have made us so and Father, we pray that you will help us always to be seeking your will precisely where we should be fulfilling what you have commanded us to do. And so we pray for your blessings upon this, your word tonight, that it will go forth with real clarity and boldness, and that each one of us would be encouraged not only to know the will of God, but to do the will of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week, as we began our overview of divine direction, we saw that knowing the will of God for us is based on scripture. We don't get uh, special revelations and dreams and visions like they did prior to the completion of the New Testament canon of scripture. And the question here was a missionary question. It was the issue of shall I go west or east or north or south. It was not a question of shall I go. It was a question of where shall I go. It was not shall I preach the gospel. The issue was where shall I preach the gospel? And all of us have been given a commission to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ wherever God calls us to go. He puts different people in different parts of the world. He puts some of us in suburban areas. He puts some of us in big cities. He puts some of us perhaps out in the jungle someplace or out in a small town. I've lived in some very small towns down in Texas. But wherever we go, our obligation is to communicate Christ to those who have not heard, to edify believers who need encouragement in the faith, to live a life of holiness and godliness that is pleasing to our Heavenly Father, to look forward with eagerness and expectancy to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Responsibilities that we have as God's stewards 
here on this earth. Moreover, brethren, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It's not whether or not you have become a great evangelist and led thousands of people to Christ. It's a question of, have you used your stewardship the way in which God has ordained for it to be used? Have you used your gifts in the way that God designed for them to be used? Have you done his will? And that's why we're studying divine direction, the will of God, the prohibitions, and the gospel green lights, which is what we look at tonight. Now you recall that God never changed Paul's commission. He merely changed his direction of the target people group to which he had sent him. And we described the map as to where Paul was walking. We saw that he walked for 250 to 300 miles before he was allowed to stop and hold a preaching campaign. He moved him all the way across a country. Rather interesting. He didn't have him stop anywhere. You know, over the last week, I've been down to Texas and back, and that involved a series of four different plane flights and two different trains and uh, <laughs> a bunch of walking and driving a car that didn't work very well, but um, got there, got back, and praise the Lord for that. And God opened up some opportunities for me along the way to talk to people had the privilege of talking to one uh, person in particular who is involved in some uh, high-level government work and uh, got to share the gospel for about an hour. God gives us different opportunities, different times, different locations. And so you need to take advantage of what God puts in your lap to do. So we saw that Paul walked through Galatia and all the way across Asia Minor from Iconium. And then he got to Troas, which is on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea. And from there, the Holy Spirit made it very clear as to where he was supposed to go. He was supposed to go into Macedonia, which brought the gospel down into Greece and all those different Greek cities where we have epistles that Paul wrote back to those cities, which we have today as our New Testament. What a difference it would have made if God had said to go east and he went to India or he went to China or he went to Tibet or went to eastern Russia or someplace else. What a difference it would have made in terms of our ancestry and our ability and opportunity to hear the gospel today. God never gives direction that's contrary to his word, a major principle that we learned last week. God never tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. God never asks you to do something that compromises his word. God never gives direction that's a mixture of both truth and error. Jesus made that clear in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In all questions of faith and practice, that is the Christian life, the practical Christian life, the scripture is obviously going to be the first source to which we turn. But most of the scripture had not been written in the New Testament when Paul was on that journey. He had the gift of prophecy, he had the gift of knowledge, the ability to receive and proclaim new special revelation, which he did, and he did it both in his own language and in foreign languages because he, as an apostle, had each of the spiritual gifts, and we've studied those in detail in the past. We've seen that those temporary gifts, the revelatory gifts, have been done away. There were seven of the 22 spiritual gifts. Seven of them were done away. Fifteen of them still remain. We've studied that in uh, detail in the past. And then we began to look at the passages where the phrase, will of God, is found. We looked at a few. We didn't look at all of them. There are 23 passages in the New Testament where that phrase, the will of God, occurs. And we saw that it relates to obedience, Mark 3.35. We saw that it relates to service, Acts 13.36. We saw that it relates to our future plans, in Romans 1.10, making request, if by any means now I, at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. And that's where we left off last week, and that's where I'd like to pick up tonight, because when you make your plans, you need to be flexible about them. I've had to learn that the hard way many, many times in my life. I have certain plans that I think are the will of God. I've got everything mapped out the way I thought that it should be mapped out. I've prayed about it a lot. I've determined what should be best, at least from the human viewpoint. I've sought to fulfill what I thought was the will of God. And then God abruptly stepped in and changed my plans. And that's why the Apostle Paul writes, making a request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. 
We need to make sure that we don't set our plans in stone. Paul says, making request. I'm asking God for his perfect will in the making of my plans and in the making of my travel and in the making of all those different things that are yet in the future that have not yet happened so that I might be in the will of God. That's what we need to do. Planning to go on vacation? Some of you still have some vacation time left this year. I was talking to a man this morning who's planning on going on vacation in several weeks. Making plans, making requests. Making plans, making requests. <laughs> Very important for us to learn that principle. The next thing we discover about the will of God is there is divine unity in the Trinity concerning the will of God. The Holy Spirit never disagrees with the Father. The Father never disagrees with the Son. The Son never disagrees with the Holy Spirit or the Father. They are always united in their will for you. So you can't say, well, the Holy Spirit motivated me to do such and such, although I know Jesus said this. The Trinity is always united in the will of God. Each is a member of the Godhead. They are co-equal, co-eternal. They have all the same attributes, all the same powers. Whatever you can say about one, you can say about the other. Except Christ is also man. But as far as his deity is concerned, there is perfect unity among the members of the Trinity. And we see that, Paul says that in Romans 8, 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We see that the will of God is involved in life transformation. That is the passage in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It is the will of God that you should be transformed. You've heard me say it before, I'll say it again. The Lord Jesus Christ will take you as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. There is a transforming process that takes place. The word transformed here is the word in Greek metamor metamorphosis, which we get metamorphosis from. It means the change from the ugly caterpillar into the beautiful butterfly. It's a change that is not at first visible as that butterfly is in its chrysalis or the moth is in its cocoon, but it is a transformation that is taking place so that one day suddenly it breaks forth and you would never recognize it for what it used to be. As God works that process in our lives, there's going to come a breaking forth in our lives. We're going to be metamorphosized whereby we are suddenly no longer the creature that we used to be. We're still the same creature. It's still the same life that's in us, but we have been changed. And that is what is the will of God. If you're resisting that, if you're resisting the work of the Holy Spirit, taking the scripture and applying it to your life so that a transformation process takes place, you are resisting the will of God. He will accomplish it, but it will be miserable for you as you go through the process. It's better to relax and say, Lord, I want your will. I want it more than anything else. And if certain things have to fall off in my life, if other things have to be changed from one color to another color, as with the brown caterpillar into the gorgeous multicolored butterfly, I want the changes that you will make. Think about it for a moment. Do you want God to change your life? Oh yes, we always want God to change our life in the way we want to be changed. But God doesn't always change our lives the way we want to be changed. If we were going to change our lives, we would suddenly, many of us, want to be 40 years younger. If we wanted to change our lives, we would want to be several million dollars richer. If we wanted to change our lives, we would want to be much stronger and healthier and maybe have a different physique and build than we have right now. We always want to change the externals. 
But what God wants to change, what his will is, is to change us from the inside out so that even as this body of flesh begins to grow old and decay, it becomes more beautiful and more radiant for Christ. That's the transformation he's making now. It's an internal transformation like that ugly worm inside the chrysalis or inside the cocoon. But there's going to come a breaking out. There's going to come a day when we receive our resurrection bodies and then that which has gone on inside will be manifested outside and there will be a different glory as Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 15 where he discusses the resurrection. Changed from glory to glory, the scripture says. I'm looking forward to that day. But right now what God is doing is he's developing you inside that cocoon or inside that chrysalis to conform you to the image of Christ where you reflect him in his beauty and in his glory. Life transformation and the will of God. The internal fruit of the Spirit is connected to the will of God in uh, Romans chapter 15 verse 32 that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Joy is one of the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. We're going to see it connected a little bit later on due to other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. But the will of God is that we begin to develop the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Because as that manifests visibly, other people are attracted, not merely to us, other people are attracted to Christ. They can see the difference between the genuine fruit of the Spirit and the counterfeit plastic fruit that the world gives to them. As related to joy versus happiness, happiness depends on Hap, the god of luck. Happiness depends on happenstances, the things that happen to us. We respond to external stimuli, and if it's good, we're happy. And if it's bad, we're sad. But joy is different than happiness. Joy is a manifestation of an inward, wonderful peace and the ability to smile even when things are bad. Every place you find joy in the New Testament, it's in the midst of difficult circumstances. That's the genuine item. That's contrasted with happiness, which is found when circumstances are good. Joy shows up when things are darkest. Like a diamond that a jeweler will take and, and place on the black velvet cloth under a brilliant light and you look at that diamond in this sea of black and it glistens and it glows and it sparkles because it has such a dark background it radiates with all the iridescent colors of light. That's the way joy is in the life of the believer. We find quite a few places where the will of God relates to spiritual gifts. In fact, Paul talks about it in relation to himself at least five different times in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Do you think Paul had any question why he was an apostle? Paul didn't say, Paul an apostle because my mother made me go to seminary. Or Paul an apostle because I looked out there and I saw some of these big TV preachers and boy they were raking in the money. So Paul an apostle by my drive to get money. No, Paul an apostle by the will of God. And Paul took the spiritual gift that God gave to him and he ran with it. And he ran hard with it. And he ran into opposition with it and he ran into suffering with it. But he ran with the gift God gave him. You say, well, that's apostle. That's Paul. That's the will of God for Paul. Okay. Did you know that the will of God applies to all the spiritual gifts? And it is the will of God that you exercise your gifts properly. Remember, 
we got 22 spiritual gifts lifted in the New Testament, and only seven of them related to the reception and proclamation of new special revelation. Only seven of them were temporary gifts during the period that the New Testament was being written. The other 15 are still there, and you have one or more of those gifts. We did an extended series on the spiritual gifts. I hope you paid attention, and I hope you took seriously the discovery of which gifts God has given you, because you will be held accountable for using them. Someday you're going to die or the rapture is going to take place. And when that happens, you will have to give an account of the stewardship that was placed in your hands. What are you doing? Say, okay, well, show me the passage where that is. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm glad you asked. Starting in verse 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are diversities of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So we've got the Trinity there. But the manifestation of the Spirit, that is the external showing of how this is at work, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. You have something that is going to be visible if you exercise it. And it's going to be not just for your own profit, it's going to be for the profit of everybody else to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit. Now we're listing a whole bunch of gifts here, so pay attention to that because we're going to have a big list of gifts before we get to our key verse. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another interpretation of tongues. Now look at verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, get this last phrase, dividing to every man severally as he will. You didn't get to choose your spiritual gift. I didn't get to choose my spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit looked down and said, I'm going to need to give certain gifts so that different churches at different periods of the life of Christian Spencer will be places where he exercises the gift of pastor, teacher, and teacher. And I'm giving him that gift and I'm going to hold him accountable for whether or not he used that gift. Christian Spencer, a pastor, teacher, by the will of God. I could write the same thing that Paul wrote. I'm not an apostle. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. I'm Pastor Christian Spencer, called to be a pastor, teacher, by the will of God. Put your name in that sentence. Here's your name. Call to be. Here's your gift. And then tack that phrase on the end. By the will of God. And it is to profit with all. That is to profit the whole body of Christ. Not merely for you to sit on it. Like that rotten steward who took the talent that was given to him and dug a hole in the earth and buried it so that when his Lord came, he simply gave it back to him and said, I didn't use it at all. I didn't go out there and multiply it. I didn't go out there and, and show anybody else. I hid it in the earth. You remember what the Lord said to him. Wicked and unprofitable servant. What are you doing? And this is the will of God. It's clearly revealed in Scripture that this is the will of God. What are you doing with the gifts that were given to you? Paul tells us at least five times in the New Testament that his apostleship was by the will of God. He didn't choose it. He probably wouldn't have chosen it if he had known in advance what it would cost in suffering. You didn't choose your gift, but the moment you trusted Christ, have you trusted Christ? Are you really saved? You know, some people don't manifest any spiritual gifts. They come to church, they sit in the pews, they talk like Christians, they sort of sound like Christians, but they never manifest any gifts. Maybe the reason is you're not really saved. Because the moment you trust in Jesus Christ, 
the Holy Spirit comes inside you and dwells in you, he takes up his permanent residency in you, as does the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and he gives you gifts to benefit the body of Christ so that the body of Christ can function properly in this world as a light to the lost. What is your spiritual gift? You have at least one, and I am convinced that all of us have more than one. Are you exercising it? Are you doing it faithfully? Or just sort of sporadically and haphazardly? Or when it seems like it's convenient? Or when it doesn't cause you too much embarrassment? Or when it's profitable for you but not for anybody else? The spiritual gifts. The will of God relates to all of the spiritual gifts and the proper exercise of them. The will of God. Here we have something very concrete and specific relates to service to other Christians. Not really the exercise of our gifts, but serving other Christians. Paul speaks about the church in 2 Corinthians 8, 5, and he says, This they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Just a few minutes ago, we sang that hymn, Living for Jesus. My life I give henceforth to live for thee, O Christ, alone. That's what it's talking about here in 2 Corinthians 8, 5. This they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. That, by the way, is the only way you'll ever be able to serve others. Because otherwise, the old flesh takes over and it will prevent you from serving others. They first gave themselves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Did you know that the will of God includes separation? The will of God for you includes the doctrine of separation. We're going to see a little bit more about that later on. Not quite sure I'll get that far tonight. But the will of God includes separation. Listen to Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. When you choose to commingle with the world, to be part of the world, to live like the world, to think like the world, to talk like the world, when you do that, you are bringing shame on the work of Christ. Why did he give himself? He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And when you continue to wallow in your sins, you are spitting on the blood of Christ, trampling him underfoot. Book of Hebrews talks about that. Talks about how there's no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fiery looking for an, of judgment an indignation which will devour the adversaries. You are going to come under the heavy, heavy, heavy chastening hand of God. You say, well, I just like a little compromise here and there, and that way I don't stick out too badly. You know, I don't want to be like that sore thumb that sticks out there. I, I want to blend in with the culture around me. I want to look like and sound like and think like and smell like the world. The world stinks. John says so over in 1 John chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The world passeth away. That word means to be wrapped up in a burial shroud. In other words, the world is dead, and it stinks. And so when you act like the world in the nostrils of God, you stink, and so do I. But he that doeth the will of God, you want to know the will of God? The will of God includes separation. The will of God includes being distinct. 
and clearly separate from the world around us. It doesn't mean that we're disengaged, but it means we are separated from the world. We are different because we are being transformed, we're being metamorphosized by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Is your life being changed, transformed, or do you still wallow in the dung pit of the world? He takes you like you are, but he doesn't leave you like you are. The will of God includes motivation. The will of God includes motivation. Why do you do what you're doing? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Why do you do what you do? We all like to look good on the outside. Wrong motivation. You do service not because you're trying to get brownie points for it. You do service not merely as men pleasers so that people think, ooh, nice person, little Miss Goody Two Shoes. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but you do it because you're the servants of Christ. You do it because you want to do the will of God from the heart. Not from any other motive, the will of God from the heart. The will of God also relates to our focus in our prayer life. The will of God relates to our focus in our prayer life. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. He talks about a man who was a godly man. He talks about a man who was a prayer warrior. He talks about a man who understood what to pray for rather than praying for his own personal carnal desires, his own personal benefit, his own personal aggrandizement, what did he pray for? Ephesians 4.12, or excuse me, Colossians 4.12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, remember, servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's exciting. Do you know how much I desire to have people pray like that for me? I pray this kind of thing for you. I pray for this congregation every morning. Judy and I used to pray together for each of you every morning. I'm alone in that now. I've lost my prayer partner. But I pray for you that you might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I want you to ask the question in your heart. When was the last time you prayed that for me? That I would stand perfect and complete in all the will of God? When was the last time you labored fervently for me in your prayers? That I would stand perfect and complete in all the will of God? That affects how I preach. That affects what I preach. That affects when I preach it. That affects what you receive as a congregation. It's a major focus of the prayer life, or at least it should be. We find the will of God is clearly and closely tied to sanctification and purity. The will of God is closely tied to sanctification and purity. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. 
It doesn't merely say that you should abstain from adultery. Adultery is a specific area of fornication. Fornication covers everything from evil thoughts, immoral thoughts, to pornography, to all the horrendous, awful sex sins that we don't even list because we shouldn't really describe them in detail, but you know what they are. They're out there. Fornication is a very broad term. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That includes the internet. That includes the girly magazines. That includes all that stuff that you know goes on. And you shouldn't be doing it. If you are doing it, you are not in the will of God. You're out of his will. And you will experience his chastening hand for being involved in it. The will of God is closely connected to thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18 In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. As you go through your day, every time something happens, good or bad, or mediocre, indifferent, do you give God thanks for it? Our day should be a day filled with thanksgiving. It's not, in all the big events of life, give thanks to God, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Or in all the really, really, really horrible circumstances of life, grit your teeth, and say, thank you, Lord, but then wince and hope it goes away. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Did you know that every time you complain, you violate that verse? Did you know that every time you bellyache about something, you violate that verse? Did you know that every time you express discontent, you violate that verse? The appropriate response for the Christian, regardless of external circumstances, the appropriate response for the Christian is to give thanks. That is the will of God. Because you see, when we don't give thanks, what we're saying to God is, in so many words, God, you don't know what you're doing in my life. You really didn't have to cut out that particular area of rot in my life because I enjoyed it. Why didn't you focus on something else over here instead? You know, I'd like to get rid of that kind of clutter, but you know, don't don't touch my my pet cow. Whenever we don't give thanks, we're telling God he does not know what he's doing. And yet, he is the one who is transforming us inside that chrysalis to shape us and mold us into the image of his glorious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Does he not love you? Does he not care for you? You're telling him you don't really love me. I'm sure that all of you, at some time or another, have had somebody with whom you had a relationship who said to you, you don't really love me. Or maybe you've said it to someone else. But you can never say that to God. If he gave you his son, who bore your sins, who died on Calvary's cross, and rose from the dead, this perfect expression of love for very unlovely creatures, as Paul says, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? God does love us, and what he does is best, and even when it's hard, and I've been through some of that hard, stuff. I've still given him thanks. I've cried a lot. I've woken up in the light the night and missed Judy a lot. But every time I give him thanks that he gave her to me for those 40 years and I give him thanks that he took her to a far better place than this miserable rotten world where we live now. And I thank him that she's gotten her heavenly rewards. And I thank him that she's full of joy and peace. 
And I thank him because I know he is cutting away things in my life to make me trust him more. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning somebody else. No. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's not somebody else's will of God. It's the will of God for you. You know, we so often want to know the will of God on all these petty issues that are out there, extraneous things, and we never focus on what the scripture says is, focus on what the Bible says is the will of God. And suddenly you will find that all these other areas that you don't quite know exactly what the will of God is, you'll suddenly discover if you focus on what the scripture tells you is the will of God, that all those issues will be resolved. They'll all fall into place. The will of God will become clear and patently clear in your life in the areas where you have question. Focus on what God has told you is his will. Did you know that patience and promise are connected to the will of God? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Too often we want to do the will of God for five minutes and then see some kind of results. We want God to, you know, hurry up and be microwaved so that in 30 seconds we've got our results. That's not what it says here, is it? For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. We love the promises of God. We want them now. We love the promises of God as long as he gets them to us within the next 24 hours. Yes, Lord, we want your promises, but we don't want to patiently wait for them. And what do you have to be doing before you get the promises? What do you have to be patiently doing before you get the promises? You have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Did you know the will of God is for you to have the kind of stellar testimony that shuts the pagans up? That you are supposed to be living such a life that it corresponds with all that wonderful glowing talk you have? And that is the way and it is the will of God so that you can shut up all those people who are bad-mouthing the Christians. Listen to what Paul says. Or Peter, excuse me. First Peter 2.15 For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You know all the arguments against Christians. You know all the arguments against those hypocrites in the pews. You know all the arguments against why in the world should I want to be like him? I'm just as good as he is. You know all the arguments about how huh, I'm better than those Christians. Why should I want their God? Why should I want to trust in their Jesus? He didn't do anything in their lives. Peter writes, for it is better. So is the will of God. That with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Peter also talks about something else whereby people will see you and whereby they will be attracted to your Savior. And that is in the midst of suffering. Twice he deals with that in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3.17 For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. It's better to get beat up because you did the right thing than to get beat up for doing the wrong thing. It's better to be thrown in jail for doing the right thing than it is to be thrown in jail for doing the wrong thing. If you do the wrong thing, you deserve to go to jail. If you do the right thing and go to jail for it, God is pleased because you've been willing to stand for what is true. Listen to what he says over the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Did you know that sometimes it is the will of God for us to suffer? We don't like to hear that. 
We think it's always going to be the will of God that we float around on cotton candy in the clouds and uh, pluck on harps and sing and smile and everybody's nice to us. Suffer according to the will of God. Commit the keeping of your souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Takes you back to creation. Takes you back to where suffering first came from. When man fell and when sin entered into the world and Adam disobeyed God's commandment. And in the day that he did so, he died. He died spiritually. He brought suffering and death and disease and decay into the world. That's why creation versus evolution is so important. Because it answers the question that all the pagans out there are asking. If there's really a good God and if he's really all powerful, why doesn't he stop the suffering and the pain? He could have saved that child's life. He could have cured that person of cancer. He could have solved the problem that we have in government. Listen. He has already provided the solution at Calvary's cross. The problem of sin is not because God is evil. The problem of sin is not because God is impotent. The problem of sin is because man is evil and man is impotent to do anything about it. But God has. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life life that goes on beyond death life that goes on beyond suffering life that goes on beyond pain and sin and decadence and all the rot that we see in the world around us today wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God keep the commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing do what's right anyway as unto a faithful creator Try to get two more of them in. Carnality and the will of God. Did you know the Bible says something about carnality and the will of God? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2. That he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Suffering comes to us. Pain comes to us to purify us. Pain comes to us so that we'll focus our attention on things that matter, on things that count, not on the trivia of the world. And when it comes to us, this is the result that God is doing in our lives. God allows it to come so that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men. God is determined to bring about his will in your life and if necessary he will bring suffering into your life so that you won't live the rest of your time in the lusts of the flesh but that you will live whatever paltry little few seconds of eternity you have in the will of God that's why even the difficulties that we go through are a demonstration of the grace and goodness of God because he is cleansing our lives so that they will be profitable and so that we might gain rewards that last for all of eternity and not merely junk that lasts for time permanency and the will of God I quoted these verses a few minutes ago but I want to go back to them because it's a different context now. Permanency and the will of God. 1 John 2.17 And the world passeth away. That was that word wrapped up in a burial shroud. You remember, that's why we don't hold on to it. It stinks. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's permanency. Doing, not just believing in. Doing, not just thinking about. Doing, not just talking about. Doing, not just reading about. Doing, not just knowing about. Doing the will of God. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That implies, more than implies, it states responsibility in the life of the believer. 
it states obligation in the life of the believer. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Well, our time is up for tonight. We still have quite a ways to go on this, so we'll have to take it for another week because we have many other things that we want to talk about in relation to the will of God and how we can know it. But you start with what God has told you is his will. Those are clear passages. These are areas of our life that we need to focus on. And as we do it, the other areas which are not so clear suddenly become crystal clear and we know the will of God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you will make us men and women of faith who desperately want to do your will and who study your word so that we will be able to discern your will. And then with joy and rejoicing, walk right into it and do it. Father, we pray that you'll take your word as expounded tonight, that you will glorify your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you'll fill each of us with your joy and peace, knowing that we are in the center of the will of God. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.